Okay, I want to start with a quote. Empire was a remarkably durable form of state. This is uh, the view of Jane Burbank and Frederick Cooper in their very impressive study, Empires in World History. They point out that by comparison, the nation state appears as a blip on the historical horizon, a state form that emerged recently from under imperial skies and whose hold on the world's political imagination may well prove partial or transitory. Moreover, empires were not all alike. They created, adopted, and transmitted various repertories of rule. An imperial repertory, they write, was neither a bag of tricks dipped into at random, nor a preset formula for rule. Faced with challenges day by day, empires improvised, but they also had their habits. What leaders could imagine, what they could carry off, was shaped by past practices and constrained by context, both by other empires with their overlapping goals and by peoples in places empire builders coveted. Imperial leaders at any time or place could only imagine so many ways to run a state. The empire ruled by the Spanish Habsburgs between 1516 and 1700 was no exception. No other dynasty had ever controlled such extensive territories, had ever ruled so many subjects, or had ever commanded such extensive resources around the world. Nevertheless, the imperial repertory of the Spanish Habsburgs consisted of just three elements, faith, diplomacy, and incest. And by incest, I mean intermarriage over several generations among a very few dynasties in order to unify and consolidate disparate territories. You'll notice that this is set in Central Park, New York. Just saying this for context. Context is important. So, although remarkably successful in the short term, this imperial repertory produced three long-term disadvantages. First, each new territory, however acquired, brought not only prestige, resources and opportunities, but also pre-existing strategic rivalries and political agendas. Second, some territories, especially those acquired through incest, lay far from the centre of government, with boundaries that proved difficult to defend, leading to wars that exacted a high economic and human toll from the empire as a whole. And finally, incest dramatically reduced the gene pool of the dynasty itself. Thus, King Charles II of Spain, Carlos II. Oh, sorry. It's a very sensitive little computer. Uh, Sanjay and I have 16, well, I think you have 16 great-grandparents. I certainly do. Charles II has six. They're recycled. They reappear again, leading to what um, they say, rather like an elevator. Inbred, level five. <laughs> so this is something of a problem. A co an inbreeding coefficient which is actually higher than that between parents and children or between siblings. Ignorant, incoherent and impotent, Charles II was the last of the Spanish Habsburgs. Dynastic accident created the Habsburg Empire. Four separate inheritances together come to Charles V, the guy whose biography I'm writing. First of all, from his father's father, he inherits the Central European lands. From his father's mother, he inherits the Netherlands. From his mother's mother, he inherits Castile and Castile's possessions in the Caribbean. And from his mother's father, he inherits Aragon, Naples, Sicily, and Sardinia. Following the death of his grandfather, he bribes the leading German princes to choose him as king of the Romans, 
which means he will be the, the next Holy Roman Emperor, and this makes him suzerain over most of Central Europe. And in the Americas, Charles's Spanish subjects expand from their bases in the Caribbean. And remember, the Caribbean possessions are quite large. They are half the size of Spain already in 1516. But his subjects will conquer the Aztec Empire in what is now Mexico and the Inca Empire in what is now South America, creating an area which together is eight times the size of Spain. Charles's only legitimate son, Philip II, inherits most but not all of the accidental empire when his father dies. The uh, Central European part over here, Maximilian's inheritance, goes to Charles's brother. But Philip II's agents managed to expand the empire too. Uh, they uh, conquer and colonize the Philippine uh, archipelago, which is named after Philip II. And in America, they create an empire which uh, stretches from the Rio Grande, or as we say in um, Ohio, the Rio Grande, uh, to the uh, Bio Bio in the south. Uh, they also, Philip II also manages to rule Brazil, because thanks to several generations of incest, in 1580, Philip inherits Portugal and its entire overseas empire, creating what his propagandists, what we would call his spin doctors, say is the empire on which the sun never set. Philip II is very proud of this achievement. He has a special medal coined to celebrate the union of Spain and Portugal. Uh, Philip II Hisp et Novi Orbis Rex. And on the other side, he has a very immodest medal, uh, motto. Notice at the bottom, uh, uh, 1580, the year of the uh, uh, junction, this? 1580, the Union of Crowns, but around the top, non sufficit orbis. This is a phrase uh, uh, coined for Alexander the Great. And you know it's Alexander the Great because there is Bucephalus, Alexander's horse, sitting on top of the globe. In July 1588, after three years of preparation, a large armada, the largest fleet ever seen in the Atlantic to that date, sails majestically from the Iberian Peninsula to the Channel, where it is to join with an army which has already reconquered half of the Netherlands, and together they are to conquer Tudor, England. A foreign ambassador in Madrid observes with admiration, and I quote, At the moment, King Philip is safe. France cannot threaten him and the Turks can do little. Neither can the, can, can the King of Scots, who is offended at Queen Elizabeth on account of the death and execution of his mother, Mary Stuart. Nothing, the ambassador predicted, could now stop Philip from conquering England. <laughs> Didn't quite work out that way. Uh, the ambassador erred. The Royal Navy... This picture is going on sale in London on the 5th of July. Any of you have a million pounds to spare? I believe they're taking bids by telephone. This is one of three copies. This is actually Sir Francis Drake's copy. You'll see on the left-hand window uh, the Royal Navy intercepting the Armada and harassing it. And in the right-hand window, uh, the storms sent by the Creator, specifically to protect Protestant England, destroy the Spanish Armada. By the end of the year, half of the vessels and half of the men who set sail have been lost. In the 1590s, three more armadas sent against England fail. The Dutch Republic doubled in size and Anglo-Dutch amphibious expeditions captured and sacked several port cities in Spain and America. In 1600, one of Philip II's chief diplomats confided pessimistically to his colleagues. Truly, sir, I believe we're gradually becoming the, uh, the target at which the world wants to shoot its arrows. And you know, no empire, however great, has ever been able to sustain many wars in different areas for long. Although I may be mistaken, I don't think we can sustain an empire as scattered as ours. 
Now, the Spanish word in the quote for scattered is derramado, which is what you usually use for blood. Spattered is perhaps more accurate a translation. But the diplomat, the Duke of Sessa, says, I don't think we can sustain an empire as scattered as ours. In other words, the empire on which the sun never set has become the target on which the sun never sets. And the next hundred years see an almost unbroken succession of territorial losses until by 1700, when the death of Carlos II distinguishes the dynasty, it no longer rules Portugal or its empire, it no longer rules northern Catalonia, it no longer rules half of the Netherlands. Why? Was this failure to defend the boundaries of the accidental empire inevitable? Contemporaries and historians have proposed two different explanations. Yes, one of the things I learned when I taught in Scotland, where my accent was even more of a problem than it is here, is that the way to keep an audience's attention is to vary between slides and blanks. So you never know quite what's coming. So the screen goes blank, you think the computer's gone off. A slide comes up, your spirits rise, your attention revives, and it will go off again. So it's just, um, I, I've been, I started teaching in 1965, and one of the things I've learned is it's a constant battle to keep you guys awake. <laughs> and one of the things I try is alternating slides and blanks. So, giving away my secret, please stay with me. Don't, don't, don't lose attention. So, <clears throat> where was I? Yes, two points, two points, two rival explanations for the demise of the Spanish Habsburg Empire. First... It is a problem of inheritance. The accidental empire was just too big to govern or defend. In other words, structural factors bring it down. Above all, competing strategic agendas, distance, and information overload. In the words of Carl Brandy, author of the best biography of Charles V to date, the unification of so many different states and people under one ruler inevitably produced almost insoluble Problems. I, then just let's not forget that word almost, almost insoluble problems. Because you see, the second, I uh, gave away my secrets too soon, you see. The second possible explanation is that it's not the inheritance, it's the rulers, it's them, it's the Habsburgs, that in fact others, other rulers could have done a better job. That in fact the Spanish Habsburgs always have sufficient resources to maintain their empire, but they squander them in pursuit of strategies based on faith, not based, based on reason. Monarchs with superior political skills, or monarchs less addicted to the proposition that God fought on their side, could have succeeded where the Habsburgs failed. In modern parlance, the problem then is not structure, but agent. Each of these explanations, I think, deserves a little more attention. <laughs> You may not agree, but that's what you're going to get. So, every component of an empire, any empire, but especially an accidental empire, brings with it a poisoned chalice, its past. Every component boasts its own institutions and identity, its own economic, defensive and strategic agendas, and often its own extensive privileges, often termed fundamental laws or charters or constitutions which are permanently guaranteed at the moment of union. Even at the best of times, the priorities of the local elites in Barcelona, Brussels, Lima, Lisbon, Manila, Milan, Mexico, Naples, and Palermo, even at the best of times, their agendas, their priorities often differed from those of the imperial government in Madrid leading to what my colleague Peter Marshall called sub-imperialism. That's to say, the guys on the periphery tend to dictate what a state does or does not do. And their favorite maxim in the Spanish Empire is obedezco, pero no cumplo. I obey, but I do nothing about it. It's a very common reaction of Spanish viceroys, particularly in America. That's at the best of times, obedezco, pero no cumplo. The worst of times, when material conditions deteriorate, whether through increased government demands, through foreign pressure, 
or through decreased resources. At those times, sub-imperialism becomes much more aggressive. Regional elites invoke their privileges as a reason for not doing what the central government wants, whereas the central government concentrates on overriding these constitutional guarantees. Classic example discovered by my doctoral advisor, John Eliot, concerns uh, the French invasion of Catalonia in 1639. And the Catalonian elite try to hold off a campaign being fought on their soil by saying the constitutions of Catalonia, guaranteed by the king with the, uh, the union with Castile, the constitutions guarantee their independence. And the Count Duke of Olivares, who is the chief minister of Philip IV, says, by now I'm nearly at my wit's end. I, I, but I say, and I shall still be saying on my deathbed, that if the constitutions don't allow us to do what we want, then the devil take the constitutions. Six months later, Catalonia rebels. The rebellion will last for 19 years. That's what sub-imperialism leads to. And these sub-imperial agendas usually increase in direct proportion to the distance that separates centre from periphery. I think it was Fernand Braudel who was the first historian to devote sustained attention to the role of distance in the failure of the Spanish Habsburgs to preserve their empire. In the first edition of uh, La Méditerranée et le monde méditerranéen à l'âge de Philippe II, he stated that in understanding the importance of distance uh, was probably the most important mental leap we had to make, we historians needed to make. Uh, one of his more famous quotes, which doesn't appear in the second edition, is un bon moitié de la décision de Philippe II s'explique seulement par le, les problèmes de la distance. Uh, he even made a nice little graph in the second edition in which he translated um, a French version, excuse me, I've got it on note. Uh, the French version was uh, distance uh, uh, ennemi public numéro un. And uh, uh, it comes from um, uh, Chicago in the 1930s when uh, John Dillinger who was described as public enemy number one. Brodel adopts this very graphic phrase for the problem of distance. What you see here is a very clever map. All those maps in the second edition are very clever. But this one is uh, a series of isochronic lines in how long it took a letter to get to Venice. He, he looked at the work of, Paul, Paul, um, of uh, Pierre Sardella uh, using the 10,000 letters registered by a Venetian historian circa, six, uh, circa 1500. And uh, Marine Sanudo always recorded not only when a letter was written, but when it arrived in Venice. And from this, Brodel constructed this remarkable graph showing that within this area, uh, it took a week, up to a week. Uh, a little further away, it was up to two weeks, up to three weeks, up to four weeks, up to five weeks, six weeks, seven weeks, etc. And that is, uh, you can draw that for Venice, but you could draw exactly the same thing for the Spanish Empire. It's a very good way of conceiving of the problem. And let us not forget that the letters travel more rapidly than anything else in the early modern world. Nothing travels as fast as a letter. A letter travels at 150 miles an hour overland and even faster by sea. And yet you still have this remarkable distance problem in getting together the information that you need. In his um, testimony to his son, Philip II, blamed many of the problems he'd faced, not half of the problems, as Brodel said, but many of them, on, quote, the distance that separates one state from another. And in the course of his reign, he repeatedly complained about the delays in the transmission of important information. So did his ministers. Indeed, one of the better jokes of the 16th century comes from a Spanish viceroy. Okay. It's not a great joke, but you know, it's a 16th century joke. Okay? And he says, if we have to wait for death, let's hope that it comes from Spain, because then it's never going to get here. All right. So, um, Brodel also points out that this problem is not unique to the Spanish Empire. He points out that actually a number of other empires uh, uh, have the same difficulty and that Spain probably is equal or indeed superior to other leading states for transport, transfer and communications. And contemporaries agree, Bradell's assertion is based on a wealth of evidence. I'm just going to cite two sources that he didn't, uh, uh, just to show that I can. Uh, an observer at the court of Spain in 1566 uh, writes back to his master in the Netherlands, you know, 
nothing happens there that is not known immediately here. Chilling phrase. Five years later, 1571, the ambassador of the Venetian Republic, a state which also prided itself on its communication system, the ambassador of the Venetian Republic reports back, there's nothing that the king of Spain doesn't know. This informational advantage is generated by the largest diplomatic network in the early modern world. Nine permanent embassies, also temporary missions elsewhere when occasion required. And every diplomat in the service of Spain receives the same sort of orders. I'm just going to quote one, but it's a fairly general phrase. It's a sort of standard rubric, if you like. There should be nothing great or small that is done or even contemplated without you knowing about it and telling me. Not even thought about and you have to tell me. During the Armada ca campaign of 1588, the king instructs his ambassador in Paris, Bernardino de Mendoza, now is the time to advise me of everything, minute by minute. His diplomats oblige. Their letters are abundant, and as I say, they develop a courier service which manages to transfer the information at the speed of 150 kilometers a day. But of course, that creates its own problem, doesn't it? If you're getting all this information, all of it coming down, it's very successful, it's very impressive, but it means you have new problems of analysis and action. And the Spanish Habsburgs never seem to have grasped this, that by fine-tuning, by improving their network of communication, they are, in fact, creating an insoluble problem for themselves. Listen to a, a contemporary strategic analyst. There's only so much that the human can absorb, digest, and act upon in a given period of time. The greater the stress, the more individuals will ignore or misrepresent data, mistake and misconstrue information, and the greater will be the prospects for confusion, disorientation, and surprise. More information from more sources, made available more quickly than ever before, equals system overload. By the 1580s, perhaps influenced by the spectacular conquest of Portugal, Philip II's success in securing information about everything minute by minute led to a dangerous illusion, a dangerous illusion that this empowered him entitled him to micromanage both policy and operations. When he finalised the plans for the invasion and conquest of England in 1587 and 1588, the king drafted the crucial documents that explained his grand strategy in consultation with a few civilian advisers, most of them priests, and sent them by regular courier to those tasked with executing them together with orders to waste no time in complaints and questions. Yes, get on and do it. Alentaos, pues, a los que os toca. Shut up and get on with your job. He also told his ministers, believe me, creeth me. Believe me as one who has complete information on the present state of affairs in all areas. That's ridiculous. Even if the king had possessed complete information on the present state of affairs in all areas, it would have been of little use because by the time his instructions reached their destination, the present state of affairs would have changed. At the same time, Philip II reacts to system overload, the system overload that he had created by focusing on the wrong things, by focusing on what his ministers call menudentias, trivia, instead of wrestling with the crucial decisions on which the fate of the monarchy depended. In 1584, Cardinal Granvelle, Philip II's senior advisor, complained bitterly, and I quote, His Majesty wants to do and see everything without trusting anyone else, busying himself with so many menudentheas that there is no time left to resolve what matters most. A few years later, Don Juan de Silva who had served Philip II as page, ambassador, and counselor 
delivered a comprehensive indictment of his master's administrative style. I'm going to quote it at length because, A, it's quite funny, but B, it's very, very, very shrewd. Although his majesty's brain must be the largest in the world, like that of any other human being, it is not capable of organizing the multitude of his affairs without making some division between those that he should deal with himself and those that he cannot avoid delegating to others. But his majesty doesn't make this distinction. Instead, he leaves nothing entirely alone and takes from everyone the material that should be delegated. And so he doesn't con concentrate on the general and the important because he's become too tired with the trivial. The same, much the same is said about his successors, Philip III and Philip IV. They spend too much time micromanaging. They spend their time hunting. They spend their time whoring. Or in the case of Philip IV, they spend their time at the theatre. When he dies, Philip IV asks to be dressed up to go to the great theatre in the sky. And there he is, dressed up to go and hear Calderon, when in fact he's going to meet his maker. They fail to address the problems of the empire on which the sun never set. And these problems, of course, become far worse during wartime. And the Spanish empire only enjoys complete peace for six months of the reign of Philip II. Only three years of the reign of Philip III. And no time at all in the reign of Philip IV. Philip IV reigns for 44 years. The guy here dressed up for the theater. He's at war for every day of 40, his 44 year reign. And war always places statesmen under intense stress. Not only do hostilities require resources that may prove hard to find, they also divert attention from other problems. Just as those other problems sometimes divert attention from winning the war. Listen to Robert McNamara, Secretary of Defense of the United States during the 1960s, eloquently voicing this timeless dilemma in his self-serving memoirs. Quote, One reason the Kennedy and Johnson administrations failed to take an orderly, rational approach to the basic questions underlying the Vietnam War was the staggering variety and complexity of other issues we faced. Simply put, we faced a blizzard of problems. There were only 24 hours in the day, and we often didn't have time to think straight. This predicament is not unique to the administration in which I served or to the United States. It's existed in all times and in most countries. It certainly existed in the Spanish Habsburg Empire. What the Spanish Habsburgs and their ministers needed was time to think straight, and they seldom found it. Uh, the very shrewd French ambassador, the Sir Seigneur de Fourcavaux, Noted in 1567, the king of Spain has so many regions to worry about that he cannot deal with all of them. And the previous year, on hearing of the outbreak of rioting in the Netherlands, a Dutch nobleman at court informed Philip to his face that, quote, delays and procrastination is what's created this problem. And he predicted that if the king continued to procrastinate, you'll face other pressing matters that will distract you from dealing with the Netherlands. Amid this blizzard of problems confronting the Spanish Empire lay a central paradox. Success often bred failure. Or in the words of Philip II's trusted minister Cristobal de Moura in 1596, however much more we acquire, the more we have to defend and the more our enemies want to take from us. A Spanish victory often led the vanquished to seek revenge through alliances with other enemies of the dynasty so that together they could snatch defeat from the jaws of victory. For example, in 1596, the year in which Moura wrote, France, England and the Dutch Republic signed a triple alliance and sought to coordinate their attacks on Philip II's empire. Just going to miss a little piece out here. I'm speaking perhaps a little more slowly than I'd expected. And uh, I want to move on to the uh, Philip IV uh, because it's a classic case of how diplomacy was neglected in the 17th century. When Philip IV comes to the throne, he has a chance to renew the truce, the 12-year truce with the Netherlands. 
and he loses it. He doesn't do it. Even though he's already fighting enemies of the dynasty in Germany. In 1635, he plots, plans, and initiates war on France, with the result before that before long, he's lost control of all Spanish territory north of the Ebro River because of the revolt of the Catalans. The Catalans placed themselves under French sovereignty. Portugal too rebels, and with military and naval assistance from France, Great Britain, and the Dutch Republic, in 1668, they force Spain to recognize the independence of Portugal. So what does Philip IV gain from fighting wars every day of his 44-year reign? In material terms, the answer is nothing. He acquired no new territory. Instead, he lost the vast Portuguese empire. He lost northern Catalonia. He lost important parts of the Netherlands. Yet even this negative outcome involves enormous sacrifices for Spain. Repeatedly, Imperial overstretch forced the central government to postpone or to abandon measures aimed at domestic recovery and retrenchment, even as it sustained great human and material losses. Most tax revenues raised in Spain are spent abroad to fund armies and navies fighting to achieve international goals that mattered to the dynasty, but not to most Spaniards. Now, most grand strategies are not entirely rational. Above all, no political leader wants to admit defeat and thereby, as we say in English, to lose face, or as the Spanish term, to, to lose reputation. And the greater the resources invested in the struggle, the harder it is to walk away. That's true today, and it was true in the 16th and 17th century. As Philip II observed in 1575, I've no doubt that if the cost of the war in the Netherlands continues at its present level, we will not be able to sustain it. But it would be a great shame if having spent so much, we lost any chance that spending a little more might recover everything. You can almost hear George Bush talking about the surge in Iraq. Again, a comparison with other political leaders. The Spanish Habsburgs always seem to be willing to take more risks to avoid losses than to make gains. It seems to have been relatively easy for them to withdraw forces from a recent conquest, such as Picardie at the Peace of Cato Combrésie in 1559, or the Palatinate in 1648 at the end of the Thirty Years' War, because they'd never really belonged to Spain. It was a different story when an integral part of the empire was at stake. In 1608, some of Philip III's ministers opposed peace talks with the Dutch after 36 years of unsuccessful struggle because, quote, it will appear good neither to God nor to the world if your majesty goes about begging for peace with his rebels. If we lose our reputation, only God by a miracle would be able to remedy the damage. The Ministry of Philip IV construct an elaborate domino theory to justify their various wars. Just one example from many, from 1624. Once the Netherlands are lost, America and the other kingdoms of your majesty will also immediately be lost with no hope of recovering them, and then Spain will stand alone. That's why they fought wars that eternalized themselves. 19 years against the Catalans, 28 years against Portugal, 80 years against the Dutch. Now this propensity to fight on, fight wars that couldn't be won, as, uh, reflect not, I think, the basics of strategy, that you, you always want to avoid a loss. You fight more to avoid a loss than you do to get a gain. It also reflects a very strange aspect of the Spanish Habsburgs outlook, their, their religious faith. They react to setbacks in a very strange way. Now the Holocaust survivor Primo Levi, an acute observer of human nature, wrote in his last book, The Drowned and the Saved, few are the men who draw moral strength from failure. But the Spanish Habsburgs were among them. They seem to see obstacles 
and even failures as a sign that God was testing them, or as we say in America, was hazing them. Take, for example, Philip II, I'm just going to give you one example, uh, Philip II's reaction in 1571, when he ordered the Duke of Alba to invade England, and the Duke of Alba says, you, you have to be joking. I, you want me to do this in a year of famine, when I don't have a fleet, my army is over, uh, underpaid and overstretched? And the king says, hmm, although the arguments you put to us are very convincing, I'm so keen to achieve the consummation of this enterprise, I'm so attached to it in my heart, and I'm so convinced that God our Saviour must embrace it as his own cause, that I cannot be dissuaded. This leads me to understand the difficulties differently from you, and makes me play down the problems that spring up, so that all the things that could either divert or stop me from carrying through this business seem less threatening to me. In short, the king concludes, although it cannot be denied that we will encounter some obstacles and difficulties, they are outweighed by many other divine and human considerations that oblige us to take these risks and more. We find the same case of spiritual blackmail in the Spanish Armada. When one of his commanders points out that perhaps sailing against England with a fleet of uh, uh, sailing ships in winter is not a very smart idea, the king replies serenely, we are aware of the risk that's incurred by sending a major fleet in winter through the channel without a safe harbor, but since it is all for God's cause, he will send good weather. Since they followed what they perceived to be the path of righteousness, the Spanish Habsburgs expected God to bridge any gaps between ends and means with a miracle. And they refused to formulate a plan B. They wouldn't formulate fallback positions for fear that it might seem that they lacked confidence it, that God is Spanish, the phrase that they used at the time. Dios es Español. You find that in lots and lots of documents. In 1574, as bad news poured into his desk in the Escorial, Philip II lamented to a minister, quote, Unless God performs a miracle, which our sins do not merit, it is no longer possible to maintain ourselves for more than a few months, let alone years. And when news of further reverses arrived, instead of reconsidering policies that had obviously failed, the king restated his expectation that God would set things right. Quote, may God help us with a miracle. I tell you, we need a miracle so much that it seems to me that God must choose to give us one because without one, everything is going down the tubes. I know, that's why I cut a piece out. Uh, likewise, in 1656, moving ahead here to Philip IV, hearing that Britain had just joined France, Portugal, and the Catalans in making war on him, Philip IV confided to his principal spiritual confidant, quote, although we lack the means to withstand even one part of this great storm, I'm going to fight on because I have firm faith that our Lord will deliver us from the great storm without allowing these kingdoms, so loyal to the Catholic Church, to be brought down by heretics. Conversely, every success reinforces this messianic vision. And there were indeed successes. 1571, Philip II's Mediterranean fleet destroys the Ottoman navy at Lepanto. 1580, his army conquers Portugal in six weeks. In 1634, a joint Spanish imperial army routs its enemies at the Battle of Nerdlingen. And in 1648, the outbreak of the Fronde here in Paris saves the Habsburg cause from total collapse. But, as Philip II might have said, but... Despite these and other successes, the Spanish Habsburgs proved congenitally incapable of preserving their inheritance intact. The repeated intermarriages that had created and expanded their accidental empire produced heirs with serious defects, not just poor health, physical deformities and weakness, but also reduced fertility. And the degree of inbreeding is stunning. Many of Charles's... Are you a Habsburg? No, okay. Many of Charles's ancestors had intermarried, creating an inbreeding coefficient for Charles himself of 0.37. So quite reasonable, okay? The one to watch is this, the number to watch is 0.25. That's what you get when two, unpleasant to say, between parents uh, or, 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 or between parent and child or between siblings. 
That's what you get, 0.25. Charles II is above that. He's more inbred, thanks to the marriage of both Philip II and Charles I, to their double cousins. And, you know, <laughs> it just doesn't work. It doesn't work in the Game of Thrones, and it doesn't work for the Spanish Habsburgs. Philip IV had eight great-grandparents instead of the normal 16, and he married his niece. He married his niece, so he becomes the great uncle as well as the father of his children. And his mother, their mother, was also their cousin. So here is poor little Charles II. Notice that he's, he's, he's sitting here surrounded by his ancestors, and there's very few of them. He's looking at his little stambuch of, of, of family. There's about four pages. They're just recycling themselves. Uh, 0.254, even higher than the offspring of siblings. Let me sum up. The Spanish Habsburgs policy of faith, diplomacy, and incest proved counterproductive in the long run. It created boundaries that were indefensible or defensible only when crises elsewhere paralyzed all their foes. Shortly after his fall from power in 1643, Olivares realized the foolishness of the policies he'd pursued, the faith-based policies that he'd pursued. And he confesses to a former colleague, this is the world. And so it always has been, even though we thought we could perform miracles and turn the world into something it can never be. Well, that's great when you've fallen from power. That's like Robert McNamara discovering in the 60s, uh, 70s, why he screwed up in the 60s. For the previous two decades, Olivares had acted on the assumption that, in his own words, God is Spanish and favors our nation. In 1650, an English statesman in Madrid marveled at the continuing capacity of Spain's leaders for self-deception. They were, he writes, a wretched, miserable, proud, senseless people. And if some miracle don't preserve them, this crown must be speedily destroyed. A generation later, one of Charles II's own ministers made the same point. I, feed, fear, I fear deeply for Italy. I'm very worried about Catalonia. And I never forget about America, where the French already have too many colonies. We cannot govern by miracles forever. As Jane Burbank and Fred Cooper observed, imperial leaders at any time or place can imagine only so many ways to run a state. And when Charles II died childless in 1700, the miracles ceased and the accidental empire died with him. The Spanish Habsburg's bag of tricks was empty. Thank you.